could use violence. From the start of Game of Thrones, there's been a hidden thread connecting two characters, Cersei Lannister and Daenerys Targaryen. These two women have shared a stunning number of things in common. Essentially, all along, they've been inverse mirrors of each other, living parallel, inverted lives. At its core, their opposition stems from where they start out. One grows up in a rich position of maximum privilege, while the other grows up poorer across the world from the Iron Throne. All of Game of Thrones has been structured around the trajectory of these two exceptional and dangerous women getting closer together. So here's our take on why the showdown between Cersei and Daenerys was always the end game, and how their conflict reveals the true message of Game of Thrones. Power is power. Do not become what you have always struggled to defeat. Before we go on, we want to talk about this video's sponsor. NordVPN is the best VPN or virtual private network out there. Right now, they're offering our viewers a limited time deal. All you have to do is click the link in the description below, nordvpn.com slash the take to get 75% off a three-year plan. That comes out to just $2.99 per month. And if you enter the code THETAKE, you'll also get an extra month of NordVPN for free. Let's look at all that Daenerys and Cersei have in common. They're both blonde, high-born women with two brothers. They're given in a strategic arranged marriage by their male relative who wants to get the family closer to the throne. Their husband is a dark-haired warrior who they develop feelings for. I felt something for you once, you know. Both lose a baby with this husband and cause the husband's death, though only one means to. They have three children, of sorts, not by that husband. Both have the self-image that centers on being a mother. But when the fire burned out, I was unhurt. The mother of dragons. Love no one but your children. On that front, a mother has no choice while their kids are to varying degrees dangerous and feared and are killed off one by one. We might also say that for each, one of the three children is a bad apple, if you count Viserion becoming an ice dragon. And the second is killed by a sudden surprise attack they don't see coming. They share incredible beauty, which they use matter-of-factly for political gain. You shall have what your heart desires when the war is won. And in order to forge a lasting bond with the Marinese people, I will marry the leader of an ancient family. They enjoy sex and take what they want. They see themselves as primary rulers. Ana Halisi. Ana Asok I am the queen! And aren't content being merely the wife of a ruler. I should wear the armor and you the gown. Who do you think she wants to share the throne? They're both products of what our world would call incest. Danny's parents were brother and sister, while Cersei's parents were cousins, and they both have an incestuous love affair. They grow up without a mother and for most of their childhood under the thumb of a controlling male family member. Both feel that they've been underestimated by their worlds and have to prove time and time again that they're more than what they see. Did it ever occur to you that I might be the one who deserves your confidence and your trust, not your sons? I am not your little princess. I am Daenerys Stormborn of the blood of old Valyria, and I will take what is mine. Both women receive unsettling prophecies about their futures. On top of all of this, throughout the series, they've gone through similar challenges around the same time. In season one, they're both queens through marriage to a male ruler. And after that, each starts to build her own power as an individual ruler. In season six, they're captured and treated inhumanely, and they respond by mercilessly burning those who were foolish enough to challenge their power. All of these echoes running through the story signal that author George R. R. Martin wants us to be actively comparing these two incredibly bright, powerful women. They get a lot of the same obstacles thrown at them, yet for much of the story, Daenerys is the role model and Cersei is the cautionary tale. Put their heads on spikes outside the stables as a warning. Time and time again, we see Danny turn a seemingly hopeless situation into an empowering opportunity, while Cersei continues to view herself as a victim no matter how many she hurts and oppresses. Both begin in a doomed marriage. And whispered in my ear, Liana. But Danny transforms hers into a loving union, while Cersei lets her hate fester. When Daenerys sees that her children are dangerous, she chains them up while Cersei refuses to put a leash on her monstrous son. It's hard to put a leash on a dog 
once you've put a crown on its head. Daenerys makes lasting bonds with people she meets in her journey, while Cersei trusts only her immediate family, and not even all of them. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. So the fact that they feel so different, considering how much they share, is telling us that we're not defined by what happens to us, but what we make of the experiences we're given. Daenerys the Unburnt is the all-powerful Earthshaker we aspire to feel like at our best. Yet, the deliciously wicked, petty Cersei embodies impulses we've all probably indulged at our worst. We can choose to be like Daenerys, to build something from nothing, take strength from hardship, remake the world when we see a better way, and help those who have even less. Or we can be like Cersei, fixate on how enemies have wronged us, see the worst in everyone, hurt others for the hell of it, and not help the less fortunate when it would be just as easy to throw them a bone. The leftovers will feed the dogs. Over time, though, Game of Thrones complicates this narrative of opposition between the good queen and the bad queen. These two women are two sides of the same coin. The fundamental reason that Cersei and Danny are inverses of each other is situational. One is born in power, rich, privileged, promised since childhood to be a queen. The other is born in poverty, exiled, hunted down, never expected to be anything. One begins with nothing to lose, the other with everything. Danny makes big, risky, offensive plays, while Cersei is surrounded by treacherous snakes and haunted by a prophecy that's outlined how much she will lose, plays defensively. You want to rule? This is what ruling is. Lying on a bed of weeds, ripping them out by the root one by one before they strangle you in your sleep. In light of all this, it makes sense why Danny views everything as positive opportunity and Cersei sees the negative angle. Daenerys wins hearts along her way, not just because she's a humanitarian, but also because she has to. The Dothraki hadn't crossed the sea. Any sea. They did for me. It's smart strategy, when you don't have anything, to inspire people to serve your cause for free. <laughs> Cersei doesn't need to do that because she can buy an army. As we see in Cersei's Walk of Shame, the inverse of Danny being welcomed as Misa, Cersei hates and fears the people. If someone is laughing at the queen who walked naked through the streets covered in shit, I want to hear while Danny loves them, and it's easy to love people who greet you like this, and harder to love people who treat you like this. I don't have love here. I only have fear. As Daenerys gains power, she faces complex choices designed to make us question whether the Dragon Queen is really as different as Cersei as she claims to be. Tens of thousands of innocents will die. That is why Cersei is bringing them into the Red Keep. The story reminds us that the identity of a hero or villain is in the eye of the beholder, and it's not fixed. If a hero starts acting villainously, we have to reassess. In fact, if we look closer, there are a number of things Daenerys and Cersei both do that, because of the way the story has been framed, come across as heroic for Danny and villainous for Cersei. Both use fire as a weapon of mass destruction. Cersei loves threatening to burn cities to the ground. I will burn our house to the ground before I let that happen. I will burn their cities to the ground if they touch her. I would burn cities to the ground. And likewise, whenever Daenerys is in a bind, her go-to tactic is to burn things to the ground. We will take back what was stolen from me and destroy those who have wronged me. We will lay waste to armies and burn cities to the ground. When Daenerys burns the Dothraki calls, her burning people alive feels utterly ruthless. And as she flexes her Targaryen muscle here and elsewhere, listen to the music that plays. This is fire and blood music. You weren't made to sit on a chair in a palace. What was I made for? You're a conqueror, Daenerys Stormborn. Both inflict painful revenge on a person who's killed their loved ones. It hardly surprises us when Cersei neglects to own her mistakes. Our baby boy killed himself. He betrayed me. He betrayed us both. But we see Danny fail to hold herself accountable too. <laughs> Mafini Maliso. 
Hasier man gile maeje. En ta yeritriva hameja. Hajieron. Both Cersei and Danny tell John to bend the knee. Cersei sends a letter with an upfront demand, while Danny sends a friendly letter via Tyrion, only to insist John bend the knee after he's risked the journey there. Daenerys won't help fight the Night King unless he does. But later, Cersei asks for less, only that John promised to remain neutral. After he refuses, everyone views Cersei as the villain for not offering her support, but on the facts alone, Daenerys has been more demanding. And while, unlike Cersei, Danny does try to check her worst instincts by listening to moderate advisors, she chose an advisor who would check her worst impulses instead of feeding them. That's the difference between you. I don't care about checking my worst impulses. I don't care about making the world a better place. Their plans for compromise often don't go well. So time and again, she responds by doubling down on her fire and blood power because that gets her results. Crucially, these two queens are driven by an extravagant faith in themselves. Each gives a pivotal speech in season seven, revealing her self-centered vision of the world. As Daenerys tells Jon about the hardship she's endured to get here, so many men have tried to kill me. I don't remember all their names. I have been sold like a brood mare. She concludes that what kept her going through all of it was faith. Not in any gods, not in myths and legends, in myself, in Daenerys Targaryen. Danny is saying she believes in herself and really nothing else. Similarly, Cersei tells Tyrion that the only thing that matters to her is herself. When it came at me, I didn't think about the world, not at all. As soon as it opened its mouth, the world disappeared for me, right down its black throat. Except when she's talking about herself, she doesn't say me. She says my family. All I could think about was keeping those gnashing teeth away from the ones who matter most, away from my family. Tyrion talks about serving Danny because she'll make the world better. Because I think she will make the world a better place. Yet her reasoning isn't that she should rule because she'll do good, but because it's her destiny. I was born to rule the Seven Kingdoms. And I will. This is very medieval logic, reminding us of divine right, the belief that a monarch was chosen by God and not subject to human judgment. I have served tyrants most of my life. They all talk about destiny. Everywhere Danny has gone, she's been hailed as a savior, as almost a goddess on earth. And she has been shaped by this god complex as much as anyone around her. Do not walk away from your queen. As the mother of three dragons, she's spent a long time feeling like she's all powerful. So many times her secret weapon allowed her to reject two bad choices and take everything she wants, not having to get herself dirty with the compromises mere mortals have to make all the time. We're here to discuss your surrender, not mine. But finally, as Daenerys' dragons and other advantages are taken away, she's forced to play Cersei's game and reveal her true colors. Daenerys is ruthless like Cersei. If you ever betray me, I'll burn you alive. She believes in herself as an exception above everyone else like Cersei. I'm no ordinary woman. By the time each queen is demanding the others surrender, they even look like each other, both wearing the color red to reflect their shared inner rage. And Cersei's play in the Battle of King's Landing is to expose that Daenerys really is no different from her. I beg you, your grace, do not destroy the city you came to save. For a long time, Danny has avoided having to truly choose between her selfish ambition and her liberator identity. So that's why Cersei sets up this exact challenge in the Battle of King's Landing. She puts the people between her and Daenerys, explicitly forcing the Dragon Queen to answer the question, does she care more about the people or the throne. Keep the gates open. If she wants to take the castle, she'll have to murder thousands of innocent people first. We are shaped by what we've lived through, and the true reason Daenerys should be a better ruler than Cersei has nothing to do with destiny. It's because she's known material hardship and can empathize with the disempowered. You're the mother of dragons. I need to be more than that. I will not let those I have freed slide back into chains. All of Game of Thrones has been about power. Power resides where men believe it resides. What it truly is and how it endangers and corrupts those closest to it. 
One of Martin's biggest inspirations was Lord of the Rings. And in that story, even the truly good-hearted lose control of themselves when they're too close to the irresistible ring. So it appears that the Iron Throne is Martin's version of the ring. A long-suffering ring bearer must destroy it to finally break the wheel, so that this temptation of ultimate power can no longer destroy everyone who comes too near. As Daenerys fulfills Maggie the Frog's prophecy to become the younger, more beautiful queen to replace Cersei, the show has been building toward its most fundamental questions. Was all that rhetoric of breaking the wheel just something you say when you're far from the reality of ruling? And is it even possible to want to rule for the right reasons? Or does everyone who seeks power finally become Cersei? In the showdown between these two queens who have mirrored each other all along, we get our answer. That Daenerys is not only the new Cersei, she's worse, because her rage is far greater. She chose violence. A Targaryen choosing violence is a pretty terrifying thing. Cersei has long fixated on destroying her enemies, and here Daenerys's mysterious obsession with the throne All my life I've known one goal, the Iron Throne is revealed to be, at its essence, not a desire to rule well, but a desire to punish her enemies. This is something she herself didn't know and has repressed up to this point. She sees the Red Keep when she's looking at that symbol of everything that was taken from her when she makes the decision to to make this personal. Meanwhile, as she loses power, Cersei moves in the opposite direction. I want our baby to live. She focuses not on anger, but on the love that has always been at the center of her life. And the way Cersei and Danny trade places underlines how much their opposing characteristics have been linked to their proximity to power. Being alone in the ruler's seat allows fury to go unchecked. A Targaryen alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. Looking back, it's not hard to see the hints that Daenerys always had this stone-hearted tyrant within her. Even when you look back to season one, when Khal Drogo gives the golden crown to Viserys and her reaction on watching her brother's head melted off. He was an old dragon. There is something kind of chilling about the way that Danny has responded to the death of her enemies. Yet Daenerys' inner dragon is woken due to a lot of factors that could have been different, like the fact that all her trusted advisors have died or become distant, and the way that Cersei provokes her. You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? If all these things had happened in any different way, then I don't think we'd be seeing this side of Daenerys Targaryen. So it wasn't inevitable for her to become a deadlier Cersei. For most of the story, the great difference between how these two women work with similar raw material underlines that we always have a choice as to what kind of person we become. Conquering Westeros would be easy for you, but you're not here to be Queen of the Ashes. No. The moral of the Battle of King's Landing is that no matter how tragic your reasons for feeling hate and craving revenge, clinging to that hatred will destroy you. Daenerys doesn't become the Mad Queen because of her genes. I'm not my father. She makes a choice. She still could have been the ruler she once promised to be until she chose violence. All right then. I didn't be fair. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. This amazing VPN lets you bypass geo-blocking to access fantastic streaming sites so that no matter where you are, all your favorite movies and shows are at your fingertips. NordVPN servers are lightning fast, so you can stream HD content without lagging footage. And with just one account, you can connect as many as six devices simultaneously. Plus, your privacy is their first priority. They have double data encryption for added security. And right now, they're offering a special deal to our viewers. Click the link in the description below, nordvpn.com slash the take to get 75% off a three year plan. If you enter the code the take, you'll also get a bonus month for free, but that's only for a limited time. So go to nordvpn.com slash the take to sign up today.